welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. So tonight, stand to your feet if you will. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Let's believe God and also tonight as we pray, let's, let's really ask God for those in Oklahoma affected by this hurricane, okay? So let's put our faith out there. Let's believe God, especially for our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are out there. Let's pray for the churches. Come on, t- let's pray together. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, God, we're just grateful we get to be in your house. God, we pray that as we open up your word tonight, God, that you open it up to us. God, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, as we put our en- attention and interest into your word tonight, I pray, Father God, that you pour into us all that you have for us. May we hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church tonight. Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the correction, and the instruction in righteousness that each and every one of our leads. Lord, we even ask for your discipline, God, because we know that you love us as your children and even give us that discipline, Father. So we thank you for it tonight. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone else, but we bless them tonight as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. And God, for those of our brothers and sisters in Oklahoma tonight, God, in the city of Moore and the affected areas around there, Father God, we just pray that you send your comfort, God. You send your strength, God. You send your provision, God. We ask for provisions of clean water, electricity, Father God. We ask, Father, that uh, people that are still waiting rescue, Father God, would be found quickly, Father, and that they would survive and be healed in the name of Jesus until they're able to get out of there, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you restore what was stolen, Father, Father God, and restore that which was lost and damaged, Father. We thank you, Lord, for supernatural provisions, God, and renewed hearts and lives, God. And Lord, you said that you work all things together for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purpose. And so we thank you, Father God, out of this rubble, you will raise up goodness and that God will be glorified through it all. And we praise you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. 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 You can have a seat tonight. Tonight, I've got a message for you called The Continuing Story of a Giver. The Continuing Story of a Giver. Now, if we're going to continue a story, we've got to find out where the story started. And actually, I was inspired as I was reading through the message this past weekend in 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. If you want to go there with me, 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, we started reading about a man by the name of Elijah, who was a prophet. This prophet stood before the king at the time, who was Ahab. He was a wicked king, and he proclaimed a drought in the land. And then God instructed him, I want you to hide by a brook where I'm going to feed you by ravens, and you can drink from that brook. Well, eventually, because there was no rain, the brook dried up, and Elijah was now told, hey, I want you to go over to this uh, widow, and she's going to provide for you. And so he goes, and he meets up with this widow, and there with the widow, he starts talking to her and he says, uh, uh, could, could you give me a drink of water? So she goes and as she's going to get him a drink of water, he says, and also bring me a little morsel of bread in your hand, please. And she turns around and says, hey, listen, maybe you didn't realize I was just gathering sticks here for our last meal, myself and my son, we were going to eat it and die. He said, that's cool, go ahead and do what you said you were going to do, but first bring me a little piece of bread in your hand, make a small cake for me first, and then you could do what you said you were going to do, because this is the word of the Lord for you, the bin of flour will not dry up, the jar of oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain on the earth. And a miracle takes place. She goes out and obeys the word of the Lord from the prophet goes and gives him this small cake first. He eats of it. She makes the meal for her and her son. And hey, the bin of flour never ran out. The jar of oil never ran dry until the Lord brought rain on the earth. Three years this miracle took place. This was an ongoing miracle, an ongoing provision for three years. Now, while I was sitting there reading this story, just getting so lit up and excited about it, I I said, well, what happened? Well, there must be more to this story. I mean, that's pretty amazing, but what else happened? And so I started to read down, and tonight that's where we're going, is the continuing story of this giver, the continuing story of this widow. 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to start reading in verse number 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 17, it says, Now it happened after these things. After what things? Well, after this miraculous provision. After the story that we just talked about. After these things, that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. Now, don't just think that this kid just passed out and was unconscious because he could breathe. No, that means he died. 
okay? There are some people who speculate, oh, no, he just, you know, passed out. No, he's dead, okay? Verse number 18, so she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? She's obviously upset. Verse number 19, and he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Verse number 20, then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? Verse 21, and he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Verse 22, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah And the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Verse number 23, And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Verse 24, Then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Now, We're going to go through these verses again, but I want to pull out some some wisdom from the Word of God tonight that applies to our lives about the continuing story of a giver. See, here was a woman who was at her last meal. Literally, she was so impoverished that she did not have hope for another day. She said, we're going to go eat our last meal, and then we're going to die. We've got nothing left. Now, a miraculous provision comes into her life And after this miraculous provision comes into her life and keeps coming into her life, her son gets sick and dies. And when we take a look at our lives, here we are coming off of probably one of the greatest weekends this church has seen. When you take a look at Commitment Week and what we're about ready to do, my goodness, we are going to secure the future of this church. And often we have a mountaintop experience and we don't realize that after you hit the peak of that mountain, there's a valley that's coming next. And these experiences in our life that God leads us through are there to strengthen us, to encourage us, to build faith, to build fight on the inside of us. Many times we see it in the Word of God that after great victories are won, mountains climb, we find fiercer battles and deeper valleys. And just because we give, it doesn't mean that all hell won't break loose against us. Just because we give does not mean that all hell won't break loose against us. In fact, you will find quite the opposite. I had an email from a guy in the church said, you know what, we, for a long time, had had a lot of debt, and we just had every excuse not to give. And one day, you know, we're, we're sitting there, we're listening to the Word, and we're just getting convicted by the Holy Spirit about bringing a tithe. And he said, finally, listen, I don't got it anyways. I've got nothing to lose like this widow. And he said, so I'm just going to give that tithe and believe God. Now, we get excited. We say, hey, all right, praise God. Now God's going to open up the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing on you so much so that you can't contain it. He'll rebuke the devourer on your behalf. And you know what? He then outlined for the rest of his email, which if we would have printed out, would have been probably five or six pages about all the hell that broke loose against him and his family in the following week. Not months, week. He had pages of just stuff after stuff after stuff after stuff. See, when we start to operate in the will of God, when we start to do God's will God's way, don't you know the devil's going to raise his head up and say, oh, wait a second. I was happy with them when they were complacent. I was happy with them when they weren't doing anything, but now if they're going to get mobilized, if they're going to start doing something, if they're going to start taking ground, then we need to unleash all hell against them. Why? To stop them, to frustrate them, to get them off God. Here it's no different with this woman. Here she is. She's following the commandment of God. She's just done something great. She's believed God. She had nothing to lose. She gives the first portion to the man of God, and now all of a sudden a miracle is taking place. For many days, and she sees it day after day after day, and now an attack comes. Her son dies. My goodness. Remember, this same Elijah had the same things happen in his life. This is the same Elijah who stood before a king and declared the word of the Lord, and the heavens shut up. We think, wow, that's great. He was obedient. He didn't care if the king was going to try and kill him. He still stood up to him and declared the word of the Lord. But right after that, what's he doing? He's drinking out of a brook and having ravens feed him. Now, if that's not enough, then he's sent to a poor widow 
who's going to provide for him. See, oftentimes there are valleys on the other side of our mountaintop experiences. Not only that, think about this. Elijah was in enemy territory. In fact, the territory he was sent to was Phoenician. And the king of that territory was the father of Jezebel, who was Ahab's wife. So King Ahab, who was mad at Elijah, his wife's dad. So his father-in-law was the king of the territory where Elijah was sent. My goodness. Here he is in the enemy's territory, right in his backyard, being supplied by a widow. See, we, we, we oftentimes want the greatness. We want the mountain. We want the, the big, and, and, and we don't realize that with that is going to come a fight. With that is going to come a battle. With that is going to come adversity and trials. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. See, we don't lodge and camp in the valley of the shadow of death. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. Are you listening tonight? So here she is, and her son is dead. Look at what she says, verse number 18. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? What have I to do with you? In other words, I didn't come to you. You came to me. I didn't offer anything to you. You asked everything of me. And now what have I to do with you? Here you are. You come. You move into my house. Yeah, we're eating off of your food, but now my son is dead. And see, we don't oftentimes think about this. Her son wasn't just loved and adored, which she is, totally. I know that mothers and sons have a special connection. I see my wife and our two boys, and I just think, man, that's, there's, there's a love. There's a connection there. But beyond that, you have a widow who has no natural provision. Her husband is dead. She has no way to continue to live without the man of God. And so her son, she's waiting for this son to grow up. Why? So that he can take care of her. So that he can provide for her. Now if her son is dead, that means that she herself has, number one, lost her love. Number two, she's lost her future. And number three, she's lost all hope. Why? Because she's a widow. So now here she is and she says, I have no love, I have no future, and I have no hope. What have I got to do with you, man of God? What have I got to do with you? Remember, the man of God came to enemy territory. So her God, lowercase g, was most likely Baal. His God is the Lord God Almighty, the one true and living God. And yet, now here she is saying, what have I got to do with you? See, that's your God. And now your God, look at what she says. Your God has done something. Look at this. Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Now, we don't know what sin she's talking about. Maybe it could be that uh, because of her worship of Baal, now she sees this great, mighty man of God, and she sees him living in her house, and the testimony of his life in her house has started to change her heart. Could be that, you know, as she sees the man of God and sees the miracle, she says, well, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I'm worshiping the wrong God. And maybe the sin she's talking about is the sin of worshiping the wrong God, and she says, have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? See, oftentimes when we encounter adversity, anybody do this other than just Pastor Dan? Because I know I do this all the time. It's like we start to encounter adversity. The first thing that we go to is what? What am I doing wrong? Anybody else other than Pastor Dan do that? I know that me, oftentimes something happened, something didn't work out. I was believing God for something, didn't come through the way I wanted to. And what did I do wrong? It's got to be a problem with me. I, I must be doing something wrong here. Maybe, maybe I'm in sin. Maybe I didn't even know it. I, I wonder if I said something cross or something mean. Maybe I've been prideful. I don't know. I gotta, I, and you start soul searching. You think, what did I do? Here's this woman. Here's something that takes place in her life. Here's adversity comes. And what is the first thing she goes to? She says, have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Now, that's the first thing she does is confront the man of God. Now, the first thing he does, verse number 19, take a look at it. Verse number 19, and he said to her, give me your son. You know, from the moment Elijah has met this lady, he has not stopped asking her for stuff. I mean, think about it. First, give me a drink of water. Give me a little morsel of bread in your hand. Oh, you're going to go die. Okay, that's cool. Just first, give me, give me, give me, right? Now it's no different. Give me your son. Oh, but here's the reason why. Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying laid him on his own bed. See, he, he had a plan. He knew that God was doing something, that God was moving in this situation. He asked her to give 
Once again, she gives again. She surrenders the boy to him, trusting the prophet for what she could not provide for herself. She, she couldn't heal the boy. She couldn't call on her God, Baal, to heal the boy. Why? Because Baal didn't provide her food, did he? And so now here she is, and he says, give me your son. And once again, she trusts the man of God, steps out in faith. See, the hardest time to give is when things are not going the way that we think that they should be. It's in those tough times that we have to push through and we have to believe the word of the Lord and we have to walk in obedience to the word of the Lord because God knows what's up. Even though Earthside, we may not know what's going on. We might be saying, I, I'm confused. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm in despair here, God. This hurts. This is painful. I don't like it. I don't want to deal with it. But as we walk in obedience and once again, we give it to God and we place it in his hands, now all of a sudden, you've got the grounds for miracles once again in your life. God will come through in a greater way. Amen. Verse number 21, and he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. See, the prophet in the Old Testament represents God to the people. He was the word of the Lord. People didn't have, like we have, a Bible sitting in their lap. They had scrolls that the word of God was written on, and they had to go to the synagogue to hear that writ read. And there was the oral tradition. They passed it on, and they had songs that they sang so that they could remember pieces of it. And that's why they had to memorize a lot of the word of the Lord. So here the prophet represents God, and he says, give your son to me. But now he's in the upper room. Now the prophet, as we take a look in the story, now it's the prophet and nobody else. Now it's the prophet and God. And as we take a look at him, look at what he does. First thing, he cries out to the Lord, verse 20, back up one verse. He cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? Now, God doesn't respond to that. If you notice, that was Elijah crying out to God. Very natural response. I know oftentimes when people come to me as a pastor and they share their issues with me and they, they share the things that are taking place in their life, you know, I'll, I'll listen listen. And I'll pray with them, I'll believe God with them, and then they might walk out of my office and I might say, dear God, what's going on? I mean, why? Some of the things that we hear in this congregation, I mean, I have very deep respect for Pastor Joel, who's our restoration pastor. Some of the things that he has shared in confidence, and you know, obviously we're not talking about y'all, he doesn't use names and things like that, but he'll say, you know, there's a guy that's dealing with this, and it's like, my goodness, I can't believe the things are, God, what is going on? Very natural response. And yet, take a look at what happens. It says then, verse 21, and he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. See, he crossed over from why to now, God, let's do. He crossed over from questioning God to asking a petition of God. See, there's a difference. And in our lives, when we go through those trying times, we may have that initial, what's going on, God? This is driving me nuts. And yet God says, don't stay there. That's natural response, and that's okay. I'll let you have that. But now, let's cross over into faith. Let's cross over into believing God. Let's stretch yourself and, and get over and get after this problem and get face to face with it. Come on, get face to face with it. Get in and stretch yourself out over it and do something with it and now believe God and ask God and now a miracle can take place. Now, child's soul comes back to him. He revives, verse 24. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room to the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Once again, a miracle has taken place. Not only a provision, now a resurrection. And take a look at what happens. Verse 24, then the woman said to Elijah, then the woman said to Elijah, then the woman said to to Elijah. See, something took place. She saw another miracle. The, the miracle of provision was not enough yet. We got to get a hold of this. We got to get a hold of this. The miracle of provision was not enough. In the natural, we can go through the motions. We can do the principles of God's word. You can tithe. You can give offering. You can do the, the principles of hard work that you will find in the Bible. But without a heart, 
Not going to do anything for you. God will just be this dude up in the clouds. And you'll be blessed. Why? Because the principles work. Even in the natural, hard work gets results. Ungodly people will get blessed. Why? Because they will work harder. They will go longer. They will do more. And they will amass wealth for themselves. In the natural, those principles work. But without a heart, God is not anything to you. It wasn't until she received her son back. See, the natural provision was great, and she, that had her attention at first, but now all of a sudden her son dies, and now here we are face to face, and now there's something, you know, Baal might be able to do some things, and maybe this was just God's thing here, but can Baal raise the dead? Can I do this? Can I raise the dead? Can I do this? No, there's just nothing left. There is nothing I can do. My love is gone. My future is gone. My hope is gone, but I will give that to the man of God, and and now the man of God brings the child back and says, see, your son lives. Your love is alive. Your future is bright. You can have hope now. And he hands the child back. And now, then, the woman said to Elijah, now, now, look at this. By this I know that you are a man of God. See, that first miracle was great. But by this miracle, I know something now. Now I know that you are a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth it's truth. See, she crossed over at that point. Before she had seen just the miracle and received the provision, and that was great. But now, now I've changed. Now I've crossed over. Why? Because God didn't just care about my day-to-day -day sustenance, and I've got another meal here, and I've got another. No, now God cared about my longevity. God cared about what I love most. God cared about my future. God cared enough to give it back to me in greater measure. See, what was important is where God showed up. Are you listening tonight? In our lives, there's a continuing of our own story. See, we started something great at this church. We started freedom for our future. We know the case statement. We love the case statement. And there were three things that we started off with. Started off with freedom for the next generation. We want to leave this church to the next generation free and clear. Not just myself, not just Pastor Luke, but listen, our Children, collectively, our grandchildren, and their children. Listen, until Jesus comes, that's the goal. Until Jesus comes. We want freedom from financial institutions. We don't want, you know, to be dictated to what is going to happen in this building and keep renewing and keep spending more money that we don't need to spend. See, the borrower is slave to the lender, and so we don't want to be in that position any longer. Even though that position got us where we're at, and even though that position allowed us to serve more people, to see more people saved and all that kind of stuff, and it was a tool in the hands of the Almighty, but now it's time for us to get out from underneath that yoke and that burden. And finally, freedom for more ministry. And we know that we can do so much more with the money that we're pouring into the mortgage now. But there was one more thing that was brought out in the very first part of the Freedom for Our Future series. And that freedom was a freedom for our hearts. And as we continue our story, we have launched into something great. We have brought our commitments and we have said, yes, we're going to do this over the next three years. But listen, that was just the provision. Now God is saying, I want your heart. I want to keep that heart. I want to keep going with that. I want to keep moving in that area. And so tonight, continuing our own story, I want to draw out a couple of things that I see from the Word of God, from this story tonight, that we can apply to our lives. Some things that we need to know, yeah. Some things that we need to do, yes. Some things that we need to experience and to feel, yes. And so tonight, take a look at these. Give, give me just a couple more minutes of your time, and we're going to find out how we can continue our own story. See, the Word of God is not just a history lesson. If that's all this was, we could go to college and get that. We could read it on our own. We could do whatever. You know, it really it wouldn't be that big of a deal to us. But this is not just a history lesson. This is about our lives. This is about how we're going to do our day-to-days. This is about what our future is going to be like and what the future of this church is going to be like. This is God's plan. This is God's will. This is God's word to us today, now, here in 2013, talking to each and every individual in this room. God is speaking to you right now. And so let's take a look at these couple of things, continuing our own story. Number one is be ready for battles in the day-to-day. -day. Be ready. Why? Because they're coming. You might be shouting and praising and amen in a church on Wednesday night and Thursday morning walk into a mess at work. You might be having the mountaintop experience one moment and the next moment not even realize that something's going to take place, something's going to happen. You're going to be facing something in your family, facing something in your finances, facing something in your home, facing something in your community, facing something in the economics. My goodness, things can come from every direction. 
Think about Jesus for a moment. Jesus is our example. We're supposed to be following Jesus. And so Jesus gives us the example and lives this perfect life. But did you know that Jesus, as he went through life, he had moments of great glory, I mean, great honor, great... I mean, people were ready to make him king at certain periods of time. They were just shouting his praises. In fact, in a matter of days, they were shouting, Hosanna. Next thing you know, they're shouting, crucify him. Jesus, if anybody had highs and lows, Jesus had them. Now think about... When Jesus had one of his greatest moments, here he is, he's just starting off. He's just ready to launch into ministry. But he knew that he had to do something. He knew that he had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And he knew that he needed the power of the Holy Spirit. So here he goes to John, John the Baptist, John the prophet, the one who has come who is greater than Elijah. I mean, this is the prophet John who's going to prepare the way of the Lord. And he goes to John, and John baptizes him there, and he, as he comes up out of the water, the Bible says in the book of Mark that the heavens are rent, they are ripped open, and God starts speaking, and the Spirit descends on him like a dove. I mean, you want to talk about a Holy Ghost, get down, Pentecostal moment in Jesus' life. Here is Jesus coming out of the water, rent heavens, voice of the Lord booming, Spirit descending. I mean, this is like amazing. Somebody take a picture. Somebody document this. Somebody do something with this. Let's camp right here. Do you know what the very next couple of verses say? It says that immediately after that, Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He went from the highest of high to the lowest of low. He went from the greatest of grace to the most adversity. See, it's no different in our lives. Oftentimes, these great experiences, these great moments will be followed by tremendous battles. And so we have to be ready. Be ready for battles in the day-to-day. Your home life and your day-to-day was ordained by the all-powerful, unerring God. He knew what he was doing when he placed you in this time, this area, in the position that you're in. God never makes a mistake. Listen, Elijah ordained, I'm sorry, God ordained Elijah to go to the widow's house. God ordained you to be born in this time in this place for such a time as this. God has great things ahead of you, but you have to be prepared that even in those places, even in that place of grace, even in that place of the will of God, even though you know that this is it, this is my time, this is my place, this is my house, that God ordained that and that there will be struggles and troubles in the midst of that. Turn me to the book of 1 Peter, if you will. 1 Peter. Back towards the end of your Bible, 1 Peter. If you hit Revelation or Maps, turn around and come back. You went too far. 1 Peter. Chapter number five, take a look at what it says. First Peter chapter five, verse number eight. Peter writes these words. First Peter chapter five, verse number eight. Look at what he says. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now I like what some of the other translations say too. They say, be alert and be on the watch. Why? Because the devil's roaring. The devil's prowling. The devil's out there, and he's looking to mess things up. In the book of Job, it says he was going to and fro, walking around the earth, and he had considered God's servant. And so we see here in the New Testament that we're not unaware of his tactics, that he is the same old devil, same old tactics, but he is a defeated foe, and he's seeking whom he may devour. That means that when he comes knocking on our door, we say, oh, no, devil, you may not. Why? Because we're sober. We, we have a mind that is understanding of what's going on, and we are vigilant. We're watchful. We're not taken back by it. We're not surprised when adversity comes into our life. See, if anybody ever promised you, oh, just become a Christian, it'll be a bed of roses, you never have to worry about anything again, God will just magically, you know, provide for all of your needs, and you're not going to have to work hard anymore, it's not going to be a struggle anymore, you know, just, just let God carry you through. Listen, that is a bunch of foolishness. God has no sons, not even Jesus, who went through this earth without tribulations and trials and adversity, and if Jesus goes through things, then that means that I'm going to have to go through things. 
But if Jesus was filled with the Spirit and with power and was equipped and able to overcome, then now when Jesus turns to us and he says, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, and he's given us the tools, and he's given us the armor, and he's given us everything we need for life and godliness, then we can lift up our head, and we can rejoice, and we can laugh at trials. We can rejoice through the circumstances. Why? Because God is on my side. God's going to take care of me. God's got a way through. And listen, I will fight my way through. I will bite and scratch my way through if I have to. I will crawl out of this thing. It's not going to hold me down. It's not going to keep me back. I may be knocked down. I may be hard-pressed. But listen, I'm not cracking. I'm not breaking. I'm not stopping. I'm moving forward. (laughs) Got to be on the watch. Got to be alert. Got to know and be ready for the battles in the day to day. Second thing is that we got to place our future in God's hands. Oh, in a society where we so worry about everything, my goodness, everybody's worried about everything. 401k is gone in the stock market and real estate's not even gone. There's no solid investments. There's nothing. Listen, who cares? God is a solid investment. God has my future in his hands. It doesn't matter if I lose everything here on earth. Listen, take the world. Give me Jesus. Why? Because I've got a future. I've got a hope. God is in my eternity and God is in my now. God will take care of me. It doesn't matter what I go through here on the earth. Why? Because I know God's got me. God's got a hold of it. I love how the apostle Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, I know who I have entrusted for that day. See, he says, God is faithful. I know that God is greater, that God is all-powerful, and God can handle it. Listen, if God can handle putting together the heavens and the earth, put all of the gravity and all of the sunlight and all the rays and everything, if he can stretch out the heavens, if he can make the ecosystems here on earth work, if he can know biology and chemistry and all, all the other studies that we study and we take a look at, if God built all that, created all that, thought all that through, worked it all out so that he could put the sun at its right distance here in the earth, place us in a gravity where we're pulled around us so that we don't burn up because we're too close, we don't freeze because we're too far away. Listen, if God thought of all that and God can sustain all that, then God can take care of our problems. God can take care of our family. God can take care of our business. Love House says that God will perfect that which concerns you and I. God's taking care of God's got us on a road of, of greatness. God is changing us from glory to glory. Now there's bumps along the road. There's turns in the road. There's things that you may not, you may not be able to see around the bed. But listen, God's got it under control. God's not shocked. God's not surprised. God is a God who tells the end from the beginning. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will even show us things to come. See, have you ever thought about that? What if you had somebody that could tell you the future? You'd be out there playing the stock market, betting on sports games, all that kind of stuff. But listen, the Holy Spirit does something greater than that. It's not just about financial wealth and that sort of thing. The Holy Spirit will will show us things to come. There have been times where I've been driving home and the Holy Spirit said, don't go on the freeway, take the side streets. I don't know why. I check the news later, there's no accidents, there's no nothing. I don't know what's going on. But God knew. I've had friends that have told me, yeah, you know what? God spoke to me and told me, don't go talk to this person today. And, and they, they said, the Holy Spirit showed me something that was going to come, and I just stayed away from them, and the situation worked out. Well, see, we, we are in partnership. We are in relationship. We are in a marriage. We are the bride of Christ, and now Christ has given us one just like him, the Holy Spirit, who now shows us things to come. He's got our future in his hands. He tells the end from the beginning. He is the alpha, the beginning, and he is the omega. He is the ending. He knows the end of the book. He wrote it, and God, therefore, isn't worried. He's not concerned. He's not frustrated. He's not in fear. He's not in therapy, and he is not on medication over our lives. Are you listening? You're there in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Back up one verse to verse number 7. How do we do this? What do we do? You've got to place it in the Lord's hands. Verse number 7, look at this. Casting. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you maybe you came in here tonight and you don't feel loved don't feel respected don't feel appreciated maybe you walked in here tonight wondering does God even know I exist I'm here to tell you some good news tonight God not only knows that you exist he not only has your number He not only knows your address, but he also loves you, and he cares for you. 
God is so in love with you. The thoughts that he thinks towards you, the Bible says, outnumber the sand on the seashore. And I believe God wasn't just talking about like going down to Huntington Beach or one of those. I believe God thinks globally. And when you think about something like that, that just blows your mind because we can't think in those numbers. And so the Bible tells us that we are to cast all of our care on him because he cares for us. What does that mean? It means cast. It means take that care. You take that thing and you reel back and then you cast it out. You throw it. You release it into the hands of the Almighty God. See, this widow that Elijah was with had a dead son in her arms. And what did Elijah say? Elijah said, give him to me. Now, she would have held on to that boy and said, no, you've done enough. Get out of here. She would have still had a dead son. Are you listening? But she obeyed once again, and she cast her care on the Lord. She gave that thing over. She rolled it off of herself because she couldn't do anything in herself, and she put it on the one who could do something about it, gave it over to God, and now God did a miracle in her life. (laughs) Martin Luther said, I've held many things in my hand and have lost them all. But whatever I've placed in God's hands, that I still possess. I've held many things in my hand, I've lost them all, but whatever I've placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Great quote from one of my heroes in the faith, Jim Elliott, who is a missionary in South America. He was actually martyred at a young age. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. See, when you place your life in the hands of Almighty God, it doesn't matter what happens. God's got your future under control. And God cares about your life. God cares about your family. God cares about your finances. God cares about your future. God cares about your business. God cares about the people in your life, your relatives, your neighbors, your coworkers. God cares. And therefore, when you take that care of yours and you cast it on Almighty God, now all of a sudden, you've placed it in the Master's hands, and God can work with that and do the miraculous in your life. Can you say amen? Amen. Last thing, last thing for tonight, last thing is look to him to provide. See, when you cast that care on God, when you look to God, God will provide for your life. Just like he provided for the widow, not only a meal, but her son back into her life. God will provide for your life. God says, look at the birds, man. They don't sow, they don't go out and plant farmland, they don't do any of that kind of stuff. And yet they've got more than enough to eat. He said, look at the flowers. Look how beautiful those flowers are. They don't spin clothes and paint on that stuff. No, they just grow. And then God says, how much more worth do you have than a sparrow? How much more worth do you have than a flower, which one day is here, the next day it's dried up and withered and tossed into the fire? See, God cares about you so much that he wants to provide for even your natural needs. Now, I know this is a a pendulum shift. Sometimes we think God is not concerned with my money. God's not concerned with my natural. God's only concerned with my spiritual. God only wants me to, you know, just pray and read the Bible and that sort of a thing. But God does, God's not here and now. God's not interested in my my furniture. God's not interested in my clothing. God's not interested in where I'm going to eat. But listen, God is intimately involved in all that stuff. Why? Because God made it all anyways. And if God is taking care of birds and flowers, how much more worth are you? Jesus didn't die for birds and flowers. Jesus died for humanity. And therefore, you have the greatest value of any of all of creation. And now God isn't going to take care of you? That makes no sense. God wants to take care of your life. One of my prayers has started to change when I, when I pray in the morning. I pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, your kingdom come. God, God, I seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And you know what the rest of that verse says? And all these things shall be added unto you. So in my prayer times, I started saying this. God, I seek first your kingdom, believing that all these things shall be added unto me. God, that you're going to provide my clothing. You're going to provide the finances for it. God, you're going to provide my housing. You're going to provide the finances for it. See, in the natural, we could worry. In the natural, we could say, oh, I'm so far underwater on my house. I'm upside down. I, you know, the payment is high, and uh, it's not going to be paid off for this many years, and all that kind of stuff. And yet God says, I've got this. Look to me for your provision. Stop looking to man. Stop looking to banks. Stop looking to institutions. Stop looking around you. Look here. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. God wants us to gaze into his face. God wants us to look to him. So we stretch ourselves out and pray. We find God. We find provision. We find life. See, that doesn't mean you stop working. 
Hello? Doesn't mean you stop stretching. Doesn't mean you stop producing. See, you still got to do your thing. Okay, it's a partnership. You do your part, God does his part, and now the train can move, see? Two parts of the same thing. God will always be faithful and will always do his part. We got to get in there and do our part. Now, that doesn't mean God helps those who help themselves. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is you do your natural. God puts in his super, and now you've got supernatural experience. Faith and works. Without it, it's dead. Last verse for tonight in the book of Psalms. Turn there with me. Great section of scripture, Psalms 145. I would encourage you in this place, if you came in here concerned, loaded down with cares, got your eyes off of Jesus, Psalm 145, when you have some time, sit down and listen, tonight when you leave and you go home, sit down and read this whole psalm. By the end of this psalm, you will be jumping up and down on your bed, shouting and hollering. The neighbors will be throwing things at your window, trying to get you to shut up. Why? Because it's so good. I mean, it just, as I was reading this, it just blessed me, and I was going to do one scripture, but I, I, I started expanding, and until eventually I got the whole Psalm 145, and I said, no, I got to reduce. I got I to edit. I got to cut it down. It's just too much, too good. Psalm 145, starting in verse number 14. We'll read through verse number 19. Look at this. Psalm 145. Verse number 14 says this. It says, the Lord upholds all who fall. You fallen down recently? Lost something recently? The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. See, some of us have such a weight and such a burden. God is saying, cast your care on me and I will raise you up. Verse 15. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. Didn't we see that with Elijah? Didn't we see that with the widow? Didn't we see that with her son? See, the eyes of all are looking to God, and the Bible says that he gives them their food in due season. We don't got to worry about it. God's going to take care of our needs. Verse 16, you open your hand. And satisfy the desire of every living thing. My goodness. Look at the provision of Almighty God. This is the one who measured the sands in his hands. This is the one who measured out the waters. My goodness. And now here it says that he opens up his hands and he satisfies the desire of every living thing. Verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. Gracious in all his works. Verse 18. The Lord is near. To all who call upon him. That means if God isn't near, you can call upon him. And the Bible says draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Are you listening? If you feel like God is distant, you came to the right place tonight because God is in the house. And if you call on his name, God is right there by your side. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. Verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. My goodness. We have to keep a healthy fear of the Lord in our hearts. We have to continually keep ourselves in the love of God, but also in the fear of God. Because God is the Almighty. God is the one who is to be feared. God is the one who is to be praised. God is the one who is to be respected and reverenced and honored. And as we do, the Bible says that he's going to take care of us. What does that mean? That means fix your eyes on Jesus. Yes, work hard. Yes, do your part. Yes, be a good steward. Yes, make sure that you know the status of your finances and your flocks and what's going on in your life. Yes, 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 yes. Do all those things, but never get your eyes on those things. Always keep your eyes focused on Jesus, focused on Almighty God, who is the one who will take care of your needs. Tonight, what did we learn? Continuing story of a giver, continuing our own story. Number one is be ready for battles in the day-to-day. Adversity will come, especially after you've had a mountaintop experience. Second thing, place your future in God's hands. Listen, he's the one who holds our future anyways. And therefore, we got to place those things that concern us, those cares. we got to place it, cast all that care on him. And finally, look to him to provide. Don't look to man. Don't look to the natural. Don't look to circumstance. No, look to God. If you got something from him tonight, come on, let's give God a praise. Hallelujah. 
Hey, I want to thank you guys for staying put. You guys are awesome. Appreciate you guys being here. And for those of you that can hear my voice there in the foyer, in the bathrooms, and down the breezeways, hey, listen up right where you're at. God wants to talk to you too. We're still not done. God's got one more thing that he wants to take care of before we leave this place. I want to first of all say thank you for allowing me to minister the word to you guys tonight. I really believe that you got something for the word of God, and it's just great. Let's not stop there. Let's make sure that before you leave this place that your heart is right with God, and that if tonight was your last night on the earth, you died. This was it. Just like that young boy, maybe you died. God forbid that should happen to any of us in this room, but what if? I want to make sure that you would go to heaven and not end up in hell. Now, sometimes people are offended by us bringing up hell, in our society, people are getting offended by everything these days, and you know, you start talking about hell and people start getting uncomfortable. No one wants to go to hell, and no one likes the thought of hell. But listen, God doesn't even like when people go to hell. The Bible records that he takes no pleasure in people's deaths. Hell was never intended for you and I. It's made for the devil and his angels that rebelled, and so hell is a very real place. It's spoken about in the Bible, all throughout the Bible. See, why do I have to say that? Because sometimes people say, well, I don't believe in hell. You know, I don't believe that a good God would send people to hell. Well, listen, he doesn't. We can choose heaven or hell here on the earth with our lives. God doesn't send people there. No, God is just and God is true. And therefore, he can't go against his word. And so we can choose where we go. And hell is a very real place. Spoken of in the Old Testament, the New Testament, Jesus even talked about it. So you can't just bury your head in the sand and say, I don't believe in hell and not end up there. It's like saying, well, I don't believe in Mack trucks, so I could stand on the slow lane of the freeway. I'll meet face to face eventually. Can't just say, I don't believe in hell, and you end up in heaven. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. I mean, you'll get there your way, I'll get there my way. As long as we all have our own truth and we stay true to that, true to ourselves, you know what, we'll end up in our heaven, whatever that means to you and whatever that means to me, and we'll all have a great time in eternity. Listen, do you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten bloody, hung on a cross. Do you think God would go through all of that and then just say, yeah, whatever you want to do, just go ahead, live your life however you want to, do your thing, and it's cool, and you, know, you get to go to heaven? No, he doesn't. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We're going to have to get there God's way. Can't get to heaven your way. Can't get to heaven my way. Can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. you got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, that's good news. I'm going to get there God's way. I know that God lets good people into heaven. I've seen, you know, a lot of bad people, and I'm not as bad as them. I used to be bad, cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. And you know what? By the world standards, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. But you know what? I've done over and above that. I've helped my neighbors out, given money to charities, and I've been nice to people and friendly. And you know what? I've been a really good person, been working on my resume for heaven. And therefore, I've done more bad than good, you know, and God will let me into heaven problem with that thinking is, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Not going to get there just by being good. In fact, you can't be good enough. Because the Bible says that our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. Not going to make it. The Bible records in the book of Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not going to make it by being good. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. My parents took me to church growing up, told me we were Christians. Hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And, and you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere? Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you are raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, that your citizenship in America guarantees you citizenship in heaven. It simply doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see that because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Not gonna make it. I love you enough tonight, respect you and honor you enough to take some time and tell you the truth. You're not gonna make it. Come on, let's talk tonight. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, I'm going to go to heaven because, you know, I, I'm, I'm here in church tonight. It wasn't just a thing when I was a kid. Here I am in church right now in front of you, pastor, and, and therefore uh, I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm going to go to heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you Christian? 
It doesn't work. Not going to make it. That's like saying I could go down to Angel Stadium in Anaheim, sit in the dugout, wear the Angels uni uniform, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. Listen, that's not going to make it. You know why they're going to find me sitting there? Drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a part of the angels. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, I get it, I understand it, but listen to me. My last church I got involved, I helped out, I sang in the choir for a number of years. I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader and got a membership card to that church. That's great, I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Will you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions? People think of you as a leader, sing in the choir. Not going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible say church involvement gets you into heaven. And did you know that nowhere, check it out, nowhere, nowhere will you find God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Not going to make it. Come on, tonight, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes people say, but I know God. Somebody told me that if I knew God, that makes me a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus, Easter, and the resurrection. I can tell you uh, stories from Old and New Testament. Sing songs at Christmas, celebrated every year of my life. I know God. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Well, if you'd read your Bible, you know the Bible says the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures. Wow. And yet that doesn't make him a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. Rather, this is about your heart. Tonight, here's the real question. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Because if not, then I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, I know our societies raked that term through the coals. They've made a mockery out of it. Made it out to be something that it's not. But listen, what does the Bible say about being born again? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, that you've given God all of your life. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you look warm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, not going to make it. Why do I say that? Because think about it. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected for the body of Christ. Got to be in or out, hot or cold, Jesus says, because if you're trying to ride the fence... Be in the middle, little of the world, little of God. Not going to make it. Tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. Count to three, and then pop my hands together. When I say three, just like this, bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People will see me. Yeah, get over it. Why do I say get over it? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment here in a safe and friendly place like this than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. But the devil thinks you are. He's going to try and push you out of it. You say, Pastor Dan, but you're pushing me. Yeah, I'm pushing you towards heaven. And that's why I'm in your face tonight telling you about this is because I love you enough to tell you the truth. God loves you so much he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Listen, you probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ended up in hell. And... To tell you the truth, everybody in the room, we're excited for you. We want you to do this. We all did this at one time or another in one way or another. So no one's judging or criticizing or condemning you. We're all cheering you on. We're excited for your new life with Jesus Christ. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Your call. Your choice. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand? Never done this. 
Never giving God all your heart and life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or out there in the Love Rock Cafe or online all around the world right now, you can raise your hand. God is watching right where you're at and then click the blue button that says respond to God and someone will lead you in a prayer right afterwards. The count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? There's three. Gotcha. Up front here. Up on top. Where you at? Three wise people already. Just give me a little wave if I don't see you yet. Anybody else real quick? We've got about three wise people. Four up on top. Gotcha. Thank you. Gotcha already. Thanks, guys. Anybody else real quick? About four wise people. Anybody else? Oh, come on. Come on. Don't tell me all the sinners left during the, the offering. Hello. If you need to give God all your heart and all of your life, come on. This is your time. This is your moment. Anybody else real quick? About four wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Give me a little wave if that's you. Just a little one. Don't want to embarrass you. Thank you. Got you right up front here. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Five wise people. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, yeah, come on. Go for it. You should. Anybody else real quick? They're pointing like the double point, which usually means way over there. But I don't see anybody yet. Anybody else real quick? About four or five wise people. Come on. Need, oh, got you up there. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? About six wise people. Come on, let's go for God tonight. If that's you. You know you need to do this. Come on. Go for it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick, I'm going to close this up in a moment. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about six wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, now listen, God just spoke to me. There's a dozen people that need to give their heart and life to Jesus, not just six, there's twice as many. Here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, in a moment we're gonna clap, we're gonna give a shout, we're all gonna stand to our feet. As we do that, get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get your purse, Bible, sweater, friend. If you need a friend, hey, come on, get in the aisle and meet me up front. If you're sitting next to somebody that raised their hand or even if they didn't but you just don't know, give them a little nudge, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you, okay? So we're all gonna stand Come on, let's stand up. Let's give him a clap and a shout. And if you raise your hand or you should raise your hand, you come right now. Come on down. Make your way to the front. From the foyer, if you want to come, just come on in. You can come into the church service. From the family rooms, you can bring your children if you need to. They'll remember this. Come on down. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just come right now. Come on. Part of me, cause you're all my life, you're all I need. Take all these pieces. All right, all right. Hey, everybody. Praise God. Thankfully, you guys came. So excited for you in life. Now, there's more than six here. That's cool. A couple more of you guys need to come. They're coming right now. And, and if you still need to come, hey, come on down. Okay? Come on down. Not too late. All right. Now, let me point something out to you guys, first of all. All that applause was for you, so everybody loves you here already, all right? We're excited for you guys. You can put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? Came to give God all of your heart and all of your life. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. Right over here is Pastor Joel. That's the guy I was talking about in the message. You know, he leads our restoration ministry, but he's also with our spiritual personal trainer ministry, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets that our pastors wrote to help you find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that I'm a Christian, what should I do? He'll give you a little booklet that'll help you to find that out. Finally, he's going to introduce you to what we call a spiritual personal trainer. What is that? It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Give us a year of your life here at this church, sitting under the word of God. Get consistent getting under the word of God. As you do, here's the promise, at the end of this year and for the rest of your life, that interest, that effort, that energy that you've sown into your life, you will reap from for the rest of your life. You'll say, I didn't know it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. You guys make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. 
hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.